for joining us. Welcome to the program. Tonight we'll be talking about conservation of nature and we'd like to find out how we are doing as Uganda. But just before we start, obligations towards nature conservation cut across society. At the national level, government is the custodian or curator of the goods that belong to its citizens. Some goods cannot be safeguarded by individuals but can be safeguarded by collective fiat. Government can promote research into understanding how man's activity affects the ecosystem, plants and wildlife. Both are linked and based on this, enact policy that protects or regenerates where the risk of extinction exists. In the past, Uganda's wildlife was as affected by war as the citizens. Today, the threat is slightly different. Illegal encroachment, poaching and destruction of habitat. In addition to policy making, government has the mandate to enforce policy. At the individual level, we control our consumption habits, our waste disposal. These two, consumption and waste, have a large impact on wildlife. Consumption in this regard refers to things like land use, low density developments that destroy habitats fall in this category. Certain products, ivory, pangolin scales, and direct consumption of wild game. Or fish, in the case of water-based wildlife, waste destroys habitat. Significant here is water pollution on Lake Victoria. And as we start this conversation, we'll start with a picture that I, I took a couple of weeks ago. I was on the shores of, of um, Lake Victoria at one of the islands. And this is what the water looked like. So this is walking from the shore and walking towards the port. So I'm getting to where the water... Okay, well, what looks like water? Because this doesn't <laughs> look like water. Is... So if we are slowly killing our lake, we're killing everything there within. And that's where we're going to start our conversation uh, for this evening. And I'll start, first of all, by introducing my guests. I'll start with Simon Nampindo, who is right next to me. He is the country director of Wildlife Conservation Society. Thank you for joining us on such short notice, Simon. Thank you for having me. All right. And, and uh, right next to him is Amos Wekesa, the founder of Great Lake Safaris and Uganda Lodges Limited. I don't know if I have to introduce you, Amos, but <laughs> I've already done it anyway. Well, so. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, right next to Amos is Barbara Duso, who is the board chair of Association of Uganda Tour Operators Auto. Thank you very much for joining us, Barbara. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. All right. So we've all seen the picture. That was on the shores of Lake Victoria. What are we doing? You and then there was silence. <laughs> 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 it's a tough one. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a very tough thing. But... Um, uh, one of the biggest challenge is that we've, we've not really reconciled development with the conservation. So there is a shift in, in terms of where we put more emphasis as a government okay. and as a people. In this case, the government is aspiring to increase jobs, so attract foreign investment. So in this case that you're citing is an investment in the flower industry, and one of the potential you know, causes of the pollution. Uh, not exclusively, because I might hang myself. <laughs> but but um, it's one of those big um, uh, sources of pollution. And the good thing here is that it is a, a, a point source pollution. It's not diffuse. It's not coming from multiple sources. So you have really control. And this is where the National Environment Management Authority should be coming in to try and uh, control how much of the uh, you know, waste can be dumped in our lakes. Okay. Yeah. But on the other hand, the, you know, the population growth, you're, you're at, we're attracting people to you know, take up some of these pristine areas because they have no alternative sources. And this goes back again to the lack of the land use um, you know, uh, plan for the whole country. We don't have a national land use plan. So everybody just does what they want. For as long as you have the property rights or some claims to a property, you're free to develop it the way you want. The way you choose. Yeah. Well, Barbara, at some point you were speaking about what's happening uh, not just on Lake Victoria but on Lake Albert, you said? Yes, uh, I happen to be an investor in um, Semliki. And uh, when we were doing a, a, a short tour of the Lake Albert as we're looking for the shoe bill, I realized that we also have some invasive species that have been introduced into Lake Albert. How they got into there, we don't know. Don't talk about the water hyacinth that we've known about. There is what we call the water lily. And when I was asking the ranger guide, what is this plant and where does it come from? They say it's a water lily and it comes from South America. However, it has a very acidic thing to it that when it's dumped even on grass, when it dries out the grass around the area, 
also dries out and it's certainly also killing the, the, the animal life that is in the water. So suddenly we need again like uh, my colleague has said, we need to work closely with the National Environment Management Authority but even we as nationals, again as you said in your preamble, we can't just leave it only to government. We yeah. need to be alert as to what it is that is affecting our environment because if we are fishermen, we get affected if the water lily is killing the fish in the lake. Yeah, we get affected if the water looks like it does and, exactly. and, and in that picture that we just showed. Exactly. But that's our water bodies. Yes, how much you um, want to that? I, I first want to thank you for the research that you... I, I like the fact that you have actually gone out to research and also experienced this. And even took pictures. Yes, yeah, and even took pictures. The thing is that one of the challenges Ugandans we have as Ugandans is that we have very little ability of or little interest in traveling around our own country. A lot of Ugandans in Kampala here, you find, this, especially those who are doing very well, you find I've gone out of this country and have never crossed Masaka, never crossed Jinja, never crossed Luero, and that's what is shocking. So they're very ignorant, educated but ignorant, on what is happening around Uganda. Um, and, and without the educated group of people that are supposed to cause proper change, including our leaders. I, I, I keep saying, guys, you can, I mean, tourism. But I will never find anybody who is in involved in marketing sales of Uganda in a national park. You don't find them there. But they will be going up abroad. How do you market a country, for example, when you're thinking like that? So for us to be able to change this country, we must know it. Mm. I appreciate Uganda based on knowledge. Now, for Ugandans, we need to understand that Uganda has got more inland water bodies, lakes, and rivers compared to any country mm. on the African country, on African continent. That's an advantage. Of course, unfortunately for us, only 0.06% of our land is under irrigation. And we are still waiting for God mm. to come and get <laughs> that water and pour it on those vegetations. Now, that said, we, nature, like, us, you know, like, like it's all known, nature can survive without us. Mm. We can never survive without nature. True. And population growth is, like a, is a challenge. But I also think that the government of Uganda must go back. To, we must all go back as a country the drawing board. Why are we killing the future? Why are we politicizing everything? We must come out clear and accept and agree that certain things, in, in as far as conservation is concerned, things must change. Mm. And these government entities, unfortunately, there are areas that can be run in a government slow way, but there are areas now that must be run like proper business entities. Deliberately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you've, you've seen the number of stories that NTV has been doing as regards to our forests, mm -hmm. the extinction, what is taking place in there. What more can we do when it comes to our forests? Um, I'll, I'll just add to the statistics that probably you already know. Um, Uganda in 1995, we had 4.82 million hectares of forest. Um, as of 2015, based on the National Forest Authority um, you know, land cover assessment, we have 1.78 million hectares. So that's a dramatic uh, decline in the forest cover. Um, but um, the biggest question here is more to do with the governance. It, it all goes back to the governance, um, the governance of natural resources. In, in terms of implementing our national development plan, where are our priorities? I know that we're guided by several, you know, five or six pillars in the NDP too, but where does environment and biodiversity, uh, what is its, you know, um, priority space? Um, and the other thing is that for a long time, I think we've experimented with um, government agencies managing these big estates, uh, like the national parks and the for forest reserves. But I think we now need to move gears and begin to manage forest estates and national parks as, as businesses. And in that case, I mean that you, you know, we set out to set a long-term you know, uh, portfolio uh, strategy for managing these areas. Just like the way NTV manages its business here. So you have to think seriously about what are your, for, do a forensic mapping of what your resources are, what are the services that you can produce and create portfolios out of that, and then attract uh, partners, build alliances, mm -hmm. and then you attract investment in that area. And you set real clear, measurable, and performance targets for that, which could vary from social environment to biodiversity uh, you know, measurement uh, units. And then um, you now begin to think of building capacity 
for people to manage those resources. And that's where the governance issue comes in, that you have to be more, what the government, we, we already have a lot of legislation. So we shouldn't be um, screaming about legislation and policy. Yeah. We, we already have those. The, the, what's lacking is the enforcement, enforcement. now. Yeah. Okay. Right. Anybody like to add to? Yeah, to I, I just want to agree with him. Um, th I think the president needs to go back to where he was many years ago. In 1993, almost half of, like, of uh, Jibali Forest National Park, which is the world capital of primate now, it's 795 square kilometers, highest concentration of primates in the world. A lot of, half of that land was land that people had settled on. In 1993, the president of Uganda himself went out and made sure that they evicted people, actually I think they compensated people and evicted people from a former National Forest Authority. Today that forest, if you quantify the value to first of all government in terms of earning, but also if you attach the, uh, the, the, the opportunities around it. Giving an example of Bigodi, Bigodi Swamps. Bigodi Swamps is a place which was a rice growing area until 1994. Mm, Some guy comes and says, leave the swamp, let the, leave, let the trees regenerate. So the, the trees regenerated. Today as I speak, that swamp has a three hour walk it has about 250 different species of birds, nine, nine different primates. It is right now creating, bringing in at least 400 million shillings to the community every single year. The first secondary school in Chivali County was set up because of that swamp. The primary school right now, all the teachers are paid because of that swamp. The clinic in that area is paid for by the incomes coming from the swamp. But beyond that, they're training young kids who, have, who like, did not go find school, S4 dropouts. And they're becoming very good interpreters of birds, becoming very good interpreters of primates. Now, at, at times when they graduate, National Forest, I mean, uh, Uganda Life Authority steals them from there. They, they, they teach more. When they have gone far in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in Uganda Life Authority, then ask the business people are now going there to get and, to and getting them to become national guides. Mm. This, is, <laughs> this is an example that should be taken across the across board. I'll give another example later. I, is there time? No, there is no time. There's but no I want time. to hear that example. So you give the example. Yeah, that example is, is Budongo Forest. Budong, I run one of the parts of Budongo Forest, as an area called Pabidi. Mm. Before I went to Budongo Forest, National Forest Authority can tell you for three years they had earned $20,000. $20,000. In three years? In three years. This is a forest that has over 1,000 individual chimpanzees and nine other primates. So many different species of birds. I wrote a proposal to the guys. I said, guys, you're having an asset. So they advertised it. I wrote and won the concession. Today, they can tell you that every single year they're not getting less than $200,000 direct to them as National Forest Authority. Wow. There are 68 park guide rangers within the community that we pay as, 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 as Great Lakes Safaris. But because of that, Pabidi is one of the most protected part, parts of Budongo Forest in general. Okay. Well, we've been touching on the wildlife as we spoke about the forest. So I, I want to ask, how are we doing with, well, let's start with the big five. <laughs> and I'll start with the lions because of the stories that have been in the news of let the 12 mm -hmm. lions that are believed to have been poisoned. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you possibly saw last week the Association of Uganda Two Operators had a press conference with regard to the lions that were killed in Queen Elizabeth. Uh, we, as the Association of Uganda Two Operators, were not pleased about what we read and what we heard about the killing of these lions. So when we actually cross-checked and found out from Uwa, they confirmed that yes, the lions were poisoned. Yes, someone from the community did it. What was the reason? Certainly there is a human and animal conflict because of the population that has grown in the community. Uh, history tells us that when Queen Elizabeth was uh, earmarked as a national park, it was created as a, bio as a biosphere. And the populations that were in the park then have obviously multiplied now and there is pressure in the parks. At that point, we also mentioned that we need to think of solutions uh, as to how we can resolve the human-animal conflict because we cannot tell the pastorals to stop taking care of animals because that's their livelihood. The fishermen who were originally there obviously depend on the lakes, again, the same natural resources we're talking about, but we need to come out with practical solutions to get the animal uh, human conflict resolved because one here we go we have animals that are in the park we've got lions that need to feed if their uh, ecosystem has been interrupted because of our human activities if we are grazing in the parks it means obviously that we are narrowing the space for the animals to move 
and that obviously the, the animals have got to feed and when they are hungry they will feed if they are being encroached upon and their you know area is being encroached upon it means that they will suddenly be getting into our community to look for food because they have not enough area mm. to survive all the other animals that they would usually be eating have moved on to another location so we need to figure out how we can handle the pastoralists can we realistically say they can continue to live in the same area with the animals i think not we need to relocate them if possible to where they can get pastures that is what we actually mentioned during our press conference and we would like to see government look at practical ways to relocate and accommodate these pastoralists I like my uh, chairperson. She's extremely very diplomatic. I think you don't have to be <laughs> diplomatic. <laughs> like I'm she I'm said, Queen Elizabeth National Park was formed as a biosphere, clearly. Man and biosphere. Right? Yeah, so animals and, and human beings were supposed to coexist. Right now, as I speak, we have 11 villages in the Queen Elizabeth National Park, which is our second largest uh, national park. It's 1,990. Almost before you, 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 car you carry on, um, I don't want to break you in half when you're on a okay. very important point. So let's take a break and you'll start us off when we return. No worry, thank, thank you. you. Welcome back. We're coming to you from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, Nile Room. Amos, take it away. You were speaking. 11 villages. Uh, Queen Elizabeth National Park, which is our second, uh, second largest national park in Uganda, is about 1,998 square kilometers. One of the key national parks on the African continent in many aspects. Um, we, it has 11 villages because it was formed to be a biosphere. And these 11 villages were formed specifically for people to take advantage of the different water bodies that were there, specifically for fishing. Now, just like everywhere in Uganda, our population is growing at 3.5%. We're adding on 1 million people in this country per year. And unfortunately, we have no plan for all these kids. We have no plan as a nation. No one knows. Everybody's going everywhere, like uh, my brother was saying. But that's something that should make us think. It is at this time that we need to protect the little that we have. And we need to make sure that we do not politicize conservation, whether of national parks or forests. We've got 500 and about 502 forest reserves. We've got 10 national parks, 12 game reserves. But I think we need to understand that the, the world is going out to try and protect what they have. Yeah. For these people, families that came into the Queen's with National Park, they also ended up, because they, f because they depleted the, the, the stock, people here, we, we like consuming. No one thinks about the yeah. depletion of any product. Now, because of that, a lot of the guys went out, started bringing, one, you know, uh, bringing in domesticated animals, the protein cows, the goats. And today, the fact is that we need to help the Uganda Wildlife Authority. We need to work with the new management and make sure that we can help. This, this, this problem is much bigger than Uganda Wildlife Authority. Mm. And it's not just about lions. How do we help? And it's not just about lions, it is also about all other species of animals, including elephants. Mm -hmm. I was in Queen Elizabeth National Park, and I was shocked at about how many elephants are being killed. Now, how do we help? As Ugandans, we should all stand up and start shouting towards the conservation of these products. Because mm -hmm. when we kill everything, in the next 10, 20 years, first of all, our children will never see them. But two, we'll have also killed the source of income. How do we, first of all, make sure that our leaders, especially parliament, Parliament should be putting more emphasis, for example, in the discussion on the protection and the preservation of what is supposed to be seen by the next generation. Because that is where the power lies. Mm. And also we need to make sure that our politicians, especially those who come from close to surrounded, uh, uh, surrounding uh, protected areas, whether it's forests, to get a bit of more sense, to make sure that they don't campaign on the basis of depleting or giving away the land yeah. of forests and national parks. Okay. Well, Simon, I'd like to hear your comment on the lions. <laughs> it's so close to our heart, um, but I, I would prefer to discuss uh, from a broader perspective because it's not just the lions that we care about. Uh, and the issue of um, uh, the main threat, uh, which is coming from the human wildlife conflict, it's, it's, it, it actually happens everywhere where we have the national parks. So uh, again, I just want to emphasize that it's more of a, gov a governance issue. Um, they've spoken to the numbers um, of uh, the population then when we had very few people in those fishing villages. First of all, those fishing villages were meant to be boat landing sites. And that's the time when Lake Albert and I mean Lake uh, George and Lake Edward were productive. All right. Now, now that the fisheries have been depleted, why do we continue to maintain those fishing, fishing villages? villages? The other thing is that 
because of the dis disconnect be, um, in terms of how government implements programs, we saw uh, the NADS program, the National Agriculture and Advisory Services, supplying chicken and goats inside the national park. And you know very well that the, the, there are carnivores there. Definitely they will come for the chicken because it's easy. It, people who don't understand the biology of uh, carnivores is that before a lion attacks any particular animal, it has to think about uh, the risk mm -hmm. and also the energy invested. Yeah. So I would go for easy targets, mm -hmm. and uh, livestock is an easy target because I'm still getting the food I need. And once you test the uh, domestic animals, then it's, it's difficult really to go, to back, go back because then you've already retrofitted yourself. You can easily find the food you want. Why do you invest? So, and, and remember, we put a lot of pressure whenever there is a killing of lions or elephants, we quickly go for Uganda Wildlife Authority, but that shouldn't be the case because yes. where is the fisheries, for example? Yes. Fisheries are, UWA doesn't manage the uh, fisheries. Yeah. So where are the fisheries? Where is the Minister of Agriculture? Mm -hmm. Where is local government in this? There's been this argument that allocation of central you know, funds to the district, um, you know, uh, uh, whatever, jurisdictions is based on population. So even the local governments are arguing that, no, if you push away these fishing villages, you're cutting deep in our cake, all right? So we need a more proactive, we need to change the whole thing. And I believe I've, I've already sent a piece to Uganda Wildlife Authority that we need to push for resettlement. We did a study in 2007 and found out that most of the land uh, which are within Chikolongo stretch all the way up to Kasese town, a big chunk of that belongs to the Uganda Land Commission and the Minister of Works and Transport. We can relocate these people mm -hmm. to those areas. Why people grow cotton sometimes, some seasons they don't grow. It's very unproductive land. Why can't we make a dramatic uh, yes. uh, a step and relocate these people? Mm -hmm. And remember, I proposed in 2004 when I was doing my research then, that we fence off these fishing villages. And the, fisher, the communities in the fishing villages pushed back. They said, why do you fence us off? We are not we're not a prison. And I said, but you complain about, uh, you know, animals coming to, you know, uh, cause, uh, you know, discomfort. Why don't you want the places to be, to be fenced up? And they said, no, we still want to access the water. We still, and I said, no, we can provide the water. We pump it because this is doable. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to go in the park. Mm -hmm. yeah. I but think for the, for the lions, I would like to just um, tell an average listening Ugandan that the whole of Africa, or the whole world has got about 20,000 lions remaining. Uganda, before the 11 were killed, we had 493 lands remaining. This country was a wildlife haven. Masson Falls National Park in the 60s, from history, was the park to go to on the continent, not just East Africa. Hello. Now we're going to lose that. And you, you are, don't understand, there's a conflict between, I think because there's no strategy for, for the country in many aspects of our lives. You see the government is saying, okay, let's market the country, which is, which is a fantastic thing, and hiring three PR farms. But at the same time, you're not conserving the, world ex the, world, the, the, the wildlife and the, and, the, and the national parks and the forests, which are actually our major stay now. Of course, we're going to diversify the tourism as numbers grow. Okay. Well, you mentioned, um, and away from the, the lands, because I know there's the elephants as well, and you'd mentioned it at the beginning of, of your talk. And at some point we were thinking, ha has the elephant population recovered from the days of war? Where the mountain gorillas do we even still have that on in eastern Uganda, Rwanda and Congo? How are we doing with the elephants? You'd started to say something and then you, you feared off. Yeah, I, 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 I was in the National Park a few days ago. And I, I, I took time. I went to um, Chambura, the village. And I just went to the normal guys because I was trying to bring some of the key guys who are benefiting from tourism. Because of tourism in Queen Elizabeth National Park, you've got so many kids that have attained skill, artisan, artisan skills. The guys can do bricks, they, they can do building, they can do swimming pools. Kids who are born in those villages. And I thought my idea was to rally them because if the tourism dies, they also have no jobs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's so many of them. So a lot of them opened up. And one guy told me, Amos, we at least know that at least 10 elephants are are killed every week. And he told me, you know what, they give these elephants sulfate, 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 sulfate. sulfate. Mm. And he told me, you know, because they're so big, they don't die in the one day. They, they follow this elephant for four days. But I also want to say, 
these elephants are not just about people should understand the trickle down effect of tourism tourism is meant to be called everybody's business the reason why it's called everybody's business when a tourist arrives in Tebe airport the, uh, the plane pays landing fee it pays parking fee before the guy leaves on each ticket the 75 dollars that government earns direct before he leaves the airport is 50 dollars for a visa mm. by the time Amos says or her says okay we are now going to send a car there the car has a driver there's a guy who supplies spare parts in, in mm -hmm. Chikubo. Who must know? Then he goes to a petrol station. This petrol station is employing people. These people use airtime. They eat food. It has a very long... When a guy goes to a, a hotel like Serena today where mm -hmm. we are, there is a, a plate of food has like six, seven farmers. Your uncle could be a beneficiary. Your sister could be... You could be a beneficiary. So when you kill a, a, an elephant in Queen Elizabeth National Park, it sounds far. But it has a direct connotation. Mm. The other day I was telling guys in the community, I was saying, you don't understand that everything on your body has been imported. Everything apart from your own flesh. The shirts, the trousers, everything on you. But that importing of those products, we buy Forex. That Forex comes in through tourism. And therefore, you are killing and you're making sure that you buying that cloth is more expensive. That really makes it so much easier to understand. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, we, we, we have also to give credit where it is due. Um, generally speaking, the large mammal population has been increasing. And, and, and we, we commend Uganda Wildlife Authority for doing a, a great job because the elephant population, we are slightly above 5,000 now compared to what it was in the 1960s where we had nearly 30-something thousand. And uh, at one point in the 1980s, we had a population which had gone as low as 900 elephants in the entire country. Okay. And now there's been uh, growing. But um, I would also dispute the facts um, that the communities are giving. Because if you're killing eight elephants every, every week... Yeah, that's what they say, but it needs more research. Most, yeah, more, need most likely we would lose the entire... Because Queen Elizabeth National Park has... The last census we did in 2014 we counted 3,000 elephants, including those that move from Virunga National Park in the Ara Congo, because they share. Yeah. They keep moving back and forth. And, and there's been a progressive increase in, uh, in the wildlife population. The mountain gorillas, we, we now have 53% of the population in the world, because they're only found in the, 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 the Virunga Massif mm -hmm. anyway. So um, it, it, it all goes back to um, prioritizing how much does government reinvest in, in the, pro the park estate or forest estate, how much? And uh, the dependence on uh, you know, tax uh, you know, revenue transfers to manage uh, these big estates, this is big land that we're managing, requires enormous investment. But if you compare the, how much we collect in terms of foreign tourism revenue and direct local revenue vis-a-vis -vis what we plow back, we're just on the other way, you know, in the south. Yeah. Yeah. And, so and I think for you, what, what you're saying, I think it makes a lot of sense. Right now, the reason, the, if, from seeing what the guys were reacting, I can tell that there is a problem. It may not be 10, but it's a challenge. Mm. But f I think the challenge for Uganda, though, is that outside uh, government entities, we do not have individuals who have private conservancies. Like in Kenya, you have private conservancies up to 153 in Kenya. One private conservancy in Kenya, because of the marketing they've done, yeah. is able to earn more money than all our national parks. But we have the future that we're trying to kill now. We can now actually discuss how can we create opportunities out of what we have. Okay. Well, we're going to take a short break. But Amos, what you spoke about, about the elephants, and um, they can't be saying it just out of the blue. No. So there has to be something happening. Yes. So yeah. even if it's not 10 or 8, it could be 1. Yes. But they've seen it happen. So I yeah. think it's something that needs to be looked into. But let's take a short break and we'll continue with this conversation when we return. <music> Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. And we are talking about uh, the, the conservation of nature in here in Uganda. So one of the things that you've all touched on has been the community's role in all of this. How do we engage communities even more. I know that at some point we used to uh, treasure in school going to the yeah. zoo, yeah. you know, yes. to these wildlife places because there was something to see. You wanted to go and see a lion that you'd heard about in school, you wanted, but now we are hearing the lions are dying and it's the communities that are engaged in all of this. How do we engage the communities? I think we need to do a lot of sensitization for the communities to understand the benefits of tourism. And uh, certainly this has to start from way back, from the children in school. We need to do it with the people who are living at the borders of the parks. 
and also we have money that is given back to the community but how is that money trickling down to this low person who actually interacts directly with the animals we need to have a much more reviewed approach to the way we deal with the community rather than simply talking about the community but not really having a positive impact that tourism has on the community Amos has elucidated on how the, com the, stu the, the, the children have actually learned different artisan skills, uh, how they've benefited from tourism, how some of them are actually absorbed into the investments that are in the parks. But we need to do a bit more than that, because by the time someone actually poisons the, the elephant, I mean the lion, what could be the reason? Could it be that uh, they didn't see any benefit from tourism? Uh, we need to do more. Even we as private sector need to do a bit more than simply talk about the fact that we are, benefit we are having this as a business. We as private sector are also thinking of how best can we engage with the community. Amo says we need to work with UWA. Indeed, it is very true. We need to work with UWA. We need to support UWA. They've done quite well by you know, working together with the community, giving back to the community. But we need to analyze a little in more in depth, a little more research. What is missing? What, what has been the reason, what has been the disconnect that has brought about the anger that the community is having towards these animals? Uh, again, he's mentioned about the li elephants, elephants being killed. Now, again, th that means as much as we are shouting about the lions, there's something else happening. And when the elephants are killed, these are also part of the big five. So once again, tourism is going to react later. We need to be more proactive now as opposed to reactive. Okay. I think just to add on what she's trying to, what she has really elo uh, eloquently talked about is that um, these communities are a beneficiary of, direct beneficiaries of what comes as park entrance. The challenge though is the politicization of everything in this country. Now, Uganda Health Authority would get three billion, for example, in a year, which is 20% of the, all the money collected into Kuneza National Park. You're going to give it to these district guys, they will spend 50, over 50% of this money in meetings, sharing allowances, and therefore the community does not see the benefit at the end of the day. I think right now, Uganda Authority must be given the mandate to do things that actually can help. Beyond that, of course, we need also to make sure that as we create these opportunities for them, the community must, must be told. We find in the national park, you know what's happening in Kenya? In Kenya, the president woke up and said, you know what, we find in the national park, we shoot you. That's what they have done. Shoot for us here, we failed. You know, because you're not going to kill an opportunity for a thousand people. We try to look up to you, one person, when you're killing an opportunity for everybody. And that's why when you're driving a car, and you're, you're ten people in the car, and there's one guy on a border border crossing, you, make, you, sh you, actually, you can actually g get out if you kill one guy then, and prevent the lives of ten people. Yeah. That's, that's, what, that's what happens. Because this is the kind of thinking that we should be. We should be. As we give them incentives, we need to make sure that we also give them uh, that tough condition. Mm. Okay. Well, and b before I ask you to make your closing remarks, I need to talk about the bird species. I know that Uganda ranks very high in the number of the bird species that we have. Are these protected? Because we're talking about the big five, and yet this is also something that calls for a lot of attention for us. Um, we will start with the national um, uh, flag species. That's the gray crowned crane, uh, which people call the crowned crane. All right. Um, the population has been reducing, and we are now at 13,000 birds. Even the breeding uh, um, success is going down. As of uh, 1995, we each, 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 each pair would, would at least produce one, 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 one baby, if you want. In, 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 in. But now they are, they're, they are hardly producing a, a, a baby or a fledgling at that. So that tells you how much uh, serious this whole issue is because we associate with this particular species that people don't know where actually it breeds. It breeds in wetlands, all right? And, and what is happening, happening to the wetlands? <laughs> <We're> <laughs> the wetlands. Those are the ones we are smashing. <laughs> yeah. And we are here very proud. It's associated with the Uganda cranes. It is associated, some businesses use it as a, a brand, but nobody's contributing to this. And so the, what we've done is basically to highlight what are those species that are highly threatened and we've already developed a national red list for all the species that are highly threatened and endemic okay. in this country. And we want the Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities to ratify that, that list. Then you elevate their protection status. Not only that, but then you argue for increased investment wherever these species really live. Because the habitats are completely smashed. I gave you the figures in terms of forest cover. 
if you see forest reducing, you don't need to ask about birds because mm -hmm. the, the, yes, the, the, the closest habitat, even a lay person would need to understand if you want to know about birds, is the trees and uh, the grasses and that type of thing. So if you're reducing the vegetation cover, ultimately you're reducing the bird, the bird you know, yeah. species. Yeah. Right. Amos, you wanted to, but that's going to be your closing. Yeah, remark, Michael, so yes. make it count. Quickly, I think every Ugandan must know that Uganda, same size as Oregon, just a small state out of 50 states in the U.S., had 11% of the world's species of birds, 1,075 uh, species of birds. America alone has got 778 different species of birds, almost the same population of birds in Queen Elizabeth National Park because it's 600, 660 um, about species of birds. America makes over $100 billion if you go and Google these statistics. And yet, they are only having the same number of species of birds as, as Queen Elizabeth National Park. So Uganda has got... Uh, 11% of the world, 50% of, of Africa, and 73% of East Africa. Now, like you said, the reason why we had this concentration was because we have different, different species for the swamps, we have different species for the forest, mountainous areas, savannas, and all these brought in different. And also when inland Europe is cold, the birds come to the Mediterranean, follow the Nile, end up in Uganda. And they find a good weather and also stay. That's how our bird numbers was, were going up. We need to take advantage of that. Okay. Are those your closing remarks? Oh yes. oh, yes. Oh, wow. That is not so <laughs> fast. <laughs> Barbara, would you like to close? Yeah. Uh, I think as Ugandans, we need to appreciate our natural beauty. We cannot keep calling ourselves the Pearl of Africa if we do not take an active role in conservation. Uh, my children always sing and they say, reduce, reuse, and recycle. There's so many things we need to take control on. We need to be self-disciplined in the way we consume the plastics that we're throwing around all over the place. It is huge and we are killing our own environment with the plastics so we need to reduce the consumption we need to reuse uh, whatever it is that can be reused and we certainly need to recycle I think every Uganda needs to do that and also every Uganda should learn to plant a tree because we are having the effects of climate change and we cannot deny that we've seen that already in our weather patterns okay and uh, f finally, Simon, well, just before you actually make your remarks, I wanted to talk about the white rhino, but then I forgot because all of you guys have so much to say and I felt like, okay. But we had last month, that was in March, mm. that Sudan, the, mm. the male mm. white rhino in, in that was in Kenya, mm. died. The last one. The last one. Yeah. In Uganda, when you go to, for example, a giant yeah. rhino camp in, in Arua, where the rhinos, as it's called, a mm. rhino camp, there's Almost no rhino at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what's happening on that front as you also close? Um, uh, I, I think at the moment, uh, Uganda Wildlife Authority is working with the Rhino Fund to, um, you know, try and breed in the, Siwa, the, Siwa. the Zua right. Ranch in okay. uh, Ruero. And the, the, the primary goal is that we can try to reintroduce uh, um, these, um, the rhinos. But there is also a challenge in terms of making them be able to reproduce um, at a rate that we, we should be thinking of if we are to introduce them. So they are, they are problematic issues. And that speaks to the idea of trying to think that we can finish everything and then try to recreate it. It's always a complex thing. Um, but as I conclude, um, I think to me what is really important, my parting shots, is that the government has to rethink uh, the public uh, model of managing forest estates, national parks. We have to go the public-private partnership way. Already we have evidence in South Africa South African nas national parks had to take a dramatic decision to go into private uh, public partnership. And that unleashed a lot of investment because they are doing the marketing. You're employing people with the right skills, uh, you know, in this coalition. They can also raise capital. You manage uh, the parks more efficiently and you make people more accountable. Mm -hmm. I'm not pushing for privatization exclusively. The structure of, of partnerships have to be thought through and those are you know, the, the, the model that we go for will really depend on the technical and managerial skills of the existing Uganda Wildlife Authority. But the other thing is that as we pursue development for this country to create jobs and also achieve the middle income status, we need to think about projects that have less impact on our environment. Mm -hmm. And we are pushing for the no net loss concept or the net positive impact, uh, uh, you know, strategy. That's the way you make people pay for what what they are actually, uh, uh, you know, incurring in terms of polluting the mm -hmm. country. Rather than, we have the fossil fuel, for example. It's a short-lived thing, but we're going to deal with a lot of environmental consequences. So how prepared are we to deal with that question is mm -hmm. our 
collective responsibility in this. Well, that's a good question to leave us with. And thank you very much, all of you, for joining us for this Sunday. That brings us to the end of our show for tonight. That This conversation continues uh, on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Be sure to engage us there. Thank you for watching. NTV Weekend Edition is coming up next.